Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, hope everyone is prepared to do some brain push-ups here. Be welcome to the AIML Think Tank Virtual Roundtable. Allow me to present our stellar co-moderators. I give you SVP travel, transport, and hospitality at Datart, Mr. Greg Abbott. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you, Marcos. And also... Uh, Yep, sorry, go ahead. We, we, also, we will have our Executive Vice President, Global Enterprise Services, and Co-Director at the AI Center of Excellence at Data Art, Mr. Eugene Kulker. Thank you, Marcus. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Marcos, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And thank you, Gene, for joining me to facilitate what I know is going to be an interesting and educational discussion today. So let's start by introducing our experts and our esteemed Think Tank participants. First up, we've got Anna Jaffe, CEO at Moby Systems. Good morning, Anna. Hey, Greg. Hi, everybody. And let me introduce Arnold Bramnick, CTO of Norwegian Cruise Lines. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for joining us, Arnold. Next up, we've got Andy Owen Jones, CEO, B4D Travel. Close, Craig, BD for travel, but hey, never mind. You need an <laughs> algorithm. <laughs> Hello, everyone. BD, of course, big data for travel. How did I mix that one up? No, big four data travel. <laughs> <laughs> you better go grab the other domain at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got the recombobulation sign above. <laughs> All right, from there, we've got Klaus Kohlmeyer, Chief Evangelist at Ideas, a SaaS company. Good afternoon, Hi. Klaus. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And we've got with us Jakob Divic. Jakob, welcome back, CTO of AirHelp. Hello. Thank you for the invite. Glad to be here. And we've got George Rukas, co-founder and partner at Hudson Crossing. Hi, Greg. Nice to be here. Thank you for joining us. We've also got Richard Harris, CEO and founder of Black Crow AI. Hi, Richard. Hey, Greg. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. And finally, we've got Sergey Shevelov, Vice President and Head of Research at Sabre Corporation, calling in from Dallas this morning. Good morning, <laughs> Sergey. How are That's you? Right. Hi, everyone. I'm doing good. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here. All right, so before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience that um, there'll be an opportunity to ask your questions via the embedded chat function. And let me uh, kick us off by setting a little bit of context uh, around the travel industry for our audience. Uh, as you may have recognized, much of the travel industry has been decimated by the COVID pandemic. Despite this fact, capital continues to flow into the industry. And like other affected industries, Travel is addressing the COVID challenges to customer interfaces and operational efficiencies by increasing automation. In fact, uh, technical automation has become a means of survival for uh, many companies that are operating on skeleton crews and decreased headcounts. Market research points to organizations being more ready than prior to COVID for innovative R&D in the areas of AI and ML. And you, our experts, represent varying industry segments, perspectives from small businesses to enterprise, from travel tech to suppliers to industry-leading consultants. And today we're here to talk about AI and ML and travel and to clear out hopefully the hype noise and to listen to those that are actually trying AI and ML firsthand. So let's get started. I'm going to kick us off with an icebreaker question and we'll just let the conversation flow from there. So the question is, despite this uh, convergence of increased willingness to bet on AI and ML promises, um, money flowing into the industry and COVID environmental necessities, which call for automation, um, reported statistics of AI and ML project failure is staggering. Sources cite between 50 and 90% of AI ML projects fail. Why is that? Is failing a part of adoption journey or what are you witnessing in the market? And Andy, yeah. before travel, was an early adopter in the space. 
<laughs> Let's start with you this morning. So interesting question. I was in some ways very encouraged when I heard those stats because 50 to 90% failure is enormous. Um, we've done about 35 or 40 implementations and I'd say three I would consider to have failed. Um, one, I think because they simply didn't understand numbers. And so when we looked at whether it was working or not, they didn't understand it. And so that was a very large company and I won't shame them by saying who they were, but I think there's a real lack of understanding of statistics in the marketplace and randomness and variability. And if you're using 95% significance to measure if something works, one in 20 isn't gonna work even if it has worked. And so I think they were one of those cases. Um, one of them I simply can't explain and one of them it was all down to politics. But in a way it's a bit different because we've got an established system that now works. We've got lots of scars in our, on our back from making it work. Um, and I think we've, we've had the opportunity to work in many different environments to see what works and what doesn't. I can imagine if you're starting off, you've got no clean data, you've got people who are a bit skeptical and you're trying for a moonshot, it's extremely difficult to cross that chasm in one go. And because people are a little skeptical, they're not willing to let you. And that's where I think partner companies can be very useful because if you can try out AI with a solution that works and actually your problem is then implementing it rather than trying to make it up in the first place, you can give people a way to try AI and to see if it works rather than have to craft something yourself and make it happen, as well as sort the politics, as well as sort the data. So that's one of the areas I think having kind of third party companies, whether it's like Richard's company or our company or whatever, sort something which is quite an established, well-managed process that we've got clear documented evidence and can point to use cases where it does work and we can show you it works. That reduces your risk. Obviously, it means you don't necessarily own some of the proprietary technology as a result. Yeah, that... If I could add, um, you know, I think um, what we see frequently is a lack of clarity around the outputs and the use cases. And so, uh, and this can come from two sources, right? right? One at the board level, if you're talking about a very large company where the CEO, the CTO are getting pressure about, hey, what's your AI strategy? This seems to be a thing that smart companies are doing. And so they'll go out and start doing something without clear goals. And then the second is a more bottoms up inside uh, the sort of VP Eng organization where, you know, the tools are out there and you can go get them and start building something. But again, there's not clear sort of commercial outputs that are going to be consumed by the enterprise. And so um, I do think that that real clarity on what are the actual business goals, right? What are the outputs of, of a machine learning system that are going to move the P and L needle inside of the enterprise. And that's how, that's how you need to start. That's where uh, uh, Black Crow is very focused also. It's just identify those use cases that will move the needle and start there. Is it better to start with something that is going to significantly move the needle and sort of roll the dice on a big project? Or is it better from a practical perspective to start with a few small things that aren't going to attract a lot of attention just to prove the case. I know Andrew Eng sort of favors that, that methodology of start small, get some wins, and then start to bring people in because there's huge politics over a lot of these projects. Often um, companies have pockets of ownership of data and you need that data, sure. but those people are not going to give that up unless you pry it out of their cold, dead hands. So is it good to start yeah. big or start small? It depends how you're doing it, right? If you're going the, the standard Fortune 500 route, which is, uh, you know, you hire a data eng team, a data science team, you use one of the, you know, uh, building on top of AWS and Azure, you use, you know, data robot or data IQ or one of those data bricks, these big enterprise uh, applications, that, that is a super high risk, super uh, expensive thing to do. And so if you're just gonna have one little, you know, use case that doesn't really move the needle, I don't think anyone's going to be satisfied. If you're doing it in a in a lighter, more efficient way, yeah, you can start small, but but there's really no need to. There's a lot of risk-free ways to test things out that if they work, uh, do move the needle. That's my view. Yeah, I, think yeah, I, I, think, I mean, we have, to, uh, go ahead, Anna. You, you tried uh, to say something before. <laughs> I was just to say our two most successful projects have been really different. 
So in one, both of them were like industry transformational projects. That's the type of project we tend to work on. Um, but in one case we did, um, Andy, what you were basically suggesting at the end, we went in, um, we proved they could solve this problem that would make them some, this was a very large company, but that like if implemented, it would make them something like $2 billion. And we kind of knew there was no way we were gonna win because we were like, this is the opportunity is so huge. And now they know they can do it. And we just told them exactly how effectively, right? So that is going to be a team, right? And now they can go to the board and they can go to their executives and they can go with, this is the end customer experience, right? Change in customer experience. This is the OPEX savings, this is the CAPEX, this is the additional revenue. Um, and now we should own this because this is so core to our business that we, there's no way we could ever trust a smaller company um, or we'd ever even a big company, right? A big company is not going to pay attention to us enough and a small company might die. <laughs> so this has to be ours. Um, and the, the other um, customer we had who so far is our fastest pilot to production relationship. Um, in that case, we proved it was possible and they've said they could never pull it inside, right? It was just a, a cultural difference. Um, and instead they hired uh, two, two people who we'd worked with before onto the team so that there was internal trust and like clear communication. A uh, Navy fighter pilot who'd like ran a thousand person team, right? They really, they staffed their internal team to ensure that the integration steps would work um, and that implementation would happen and that the project wouldn't de-scope over time. Um, and they got board approval and they got CTO approval and CEO approval and CDO, approval. like they got everyone to buy in. And in that case, we were able to get to a successful POC to live um, project in, in something like four or five months. But when, when it isn't one of those two cases where there's you know tons of uh, executive level sort of support sponsorship and really smart, smart internal management and integration support, um, or it's just entirely inside and internal. I do think it can be quite difficult uh, for these projects to be successful in part because of the definition of AI. I think like, like you, Greg, when you opened this, you said automation, right? But in my mind, there's sort of three kinds of AI. There's automation, which is like digitizing tasks people shouldn't really do, that it makes sense for technology to do. Um, there's AI, which is like artificial intelligence, the way we talk about it, which is maybe like NLP. And in my mind, that's doing things people are really good at that artificial intelligence still sort of struggles to do well. Um, and then there's what we think about as AI, which I call more associative intelligence. And it's doing things that people can't do, right? Like processing quantities of data in real time that's spatial, um, on quantity and at scale that even a team of a hundred people couldn't handle, right? To make predictions about who someone is gonna be, what they're gonna want, what they're gonna need, when they're gonna need it, how much they're gonna wanna pay, what they're gonna wanna do um, and applying that in a travel context. But um, one, of, one of the challenges one's got is be, precisely because people can't do that, people don't tend to trust the results yeah. or rather you've got to get that balance right between what's a black box approach to AI and how can you make it really explicit? Um, and the more you make it explicit, the more you dumb it down in yeah. a way. And then you give people the tools to adjust it because they really want also some control over it. And if you give them control over it, it tends to mess it up. Yeah. And so you're yeah, caught they wanted in this a linear conundrum. equation to represent the thing. And I was like, there is no linear equation that represents this like <laughs> hundred or thousand vector, <laughs> right? Neural learning. Well, I think that's yeah, Andy, you really made a good point there because, I mean, we have, um, you know, around 13,000 clients right now, um, um, hotel clients around the world. And the one thing that we spend a significant time uh, on every single year or, or month is, is the benefits that come out of the machine learning. I'm not going to talk about AI because I'd be careful. I'm sure there's some of our scientists on the phone, so I'll talk about ML. <laughs> um, the machine learning that we apply in our, in our pricing solution. And, and we have to re-establish the benefits on a very frequent basis. And even some of our biggest clients that have worked with us for many, many years, we do testing on a very small case, maybe 1% of the entire portfolio to test out new methodologies and, and new algorithms. And only when they're proven out and the, the leadership has endorsed them, then we can roll them out on the full scale. So it's a, it's kind of a small step every time and re, reproving the benefits every single time. Yeah, precisely, this is what we were doing when we were deploying our automations, be it uh, a simple decision system or, or be it uh, some more fancy deep learning. Uh, we're always 
testing the, the the results starting from small samples and in ideal case it also always depends but in ideal case uh, you can also have humans process similar data and uh, give a decision and then you can compare oh look humans uh, are like 80 percent accurate and our uh, algorithm is 95 percent accurate right so uh, we are actually even better than humans this is this is a, a real case scenario where uh, we deployed uh, bot that assesses whether a case uh, against an airline is strong enough to go to, to a court, right? So uh, cost of failure are, are obviously quite big because if you lose, then you need to cover all the costs, uh, legal costs, etc. Uh, so we, we really wanted to, to make sure that uh, our way of predicting uh, cases makes sense. And uh, for a longer period of time, uh, we had Lara, our bot, predicting uh, whether a case is strong enough and uh, real human beings uh, doing the same exercise and then we compared the results and this is how we proved that the system is uh, is good and that now Lara is handling like 95 percent of, of cases that uh, that we are processing at our hope. I'd like to add a couple cents and then ask Arnold to comment on that if that's okay. So I teach uh, AI business innovation at NYU and one of the tips the students always ask me about is how to align expectations of senior execs of uh, stakeholders with regard to AI, with this enormous uh, failure rate of AI projects, right? And Andy heads off with your 90% success rate. This is exactly opposite to average in industry. So um, I'd like uh, Arnold to comment, how are you aligning expectations of non-experts, non-AI experts, decision makers uh, with regard to AI? Uh, work you're doing with them? So we, um, at my company, at Norwegian, and to my knowledge, at my competitors' companies, cruise lines tend to be serious technical laggards, um, and sometimes embarrassingly so. Um, we're certainly not on the bleeding edge of technology. We don't have any particular problem that we need to have solved. Well, that's probably arguable. Um, that uh, we need to be on the bleeding edge of technology. So uh, in, in the current environment, right, in the current COVID environment, we are not, AI, ML is not a conversation at the moment. It's how to go back to sale, contact tracing, what does the CDC want us to do, that sort of thing. I take COVID out of the conversation and say, okay, what, what was I doing in 2019? What do I hope to be doing at the end of 2021? Um, I think a lot of the comments that were made are, are spot on. You have to have um, very clear, reasonable targets. You have to have a problem, a reasonable size problem to solve. You have to have absolute buy-in from the teams that are going to be using it. And that's also a challenge because the teams that, I mean, revenue management and pricing is an interesting example. Um, we have a reservation system that uh, one of our brands uses that is formula based. Um, most of the, uh, uh, just as a quick recap for those who don't know, in the, in, in the majority of the, of the airline and uh, cruise business, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between a fare code and a price. So there's a, a ton of fare codes and they map to the prices. Our system for one of the brands doesn't work that way. It's formula based. Uh, we can, the system allows you to program a formula that says you plot a curve based on what you expect your load, your, your loading, base loading to be over time between now and sailing date. And it's a curve. And then you say, okay, we expect, um, we expect our bookings to run on this curve. So if they're running below the curve, we might want to offer discounts or some other promotions to get us back in there. If we're running over the curve, we probably want to turn those off to maximize profits because there's something going on. And the system does that quite well. The revenue management team is not comfortable with it because they decided that human beings and spreadsheets are smarter than computers and formulae are. And they, they have once a week planning meetings and going into that mindset of the folks with that mindset and saying, let's have a computer outside of the reservation system, um, uh, you know, give you advice is probably an easier way to get them to buy into it. Um, but at the end of the day, they may very well just dismiss it. I mean, we have, we have analysis. I, I'm, I'm just trying to think in my industry of what it is that we actually could reasonable, what, what reasonable sort of tackleable uh, uh, use cases we could have. 
Um, we, what about vessel vessel performance optimization, like fuel um, or you know maintenance or you know things around that uh, side of operating the actual vessel? Do you, are you guys using uh, ML or AI in, in any way in that side? Of I vessel? need to plead ignorance in that one. My my particular role is on the reservation system website, mobile app, um, customer facing type things, the back office. And you know the the engine performance and and how we do our you know uh, uh, commodity buys of fuel to to try and offset the future price changes and the like and hedging. I, I'm not I'm I have no visibility into those things at all. Uh, well, what about Arnold? If 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 you could predict the future value of every single user inside of your app or on the on the website, if you knew in advance whether they were going to buy or not, or how likely they would. Wouldn't that be helpful? If there was a way to action it within the reservation system, yes. Yeah. Now, can I ask you this question? Uh, but there are a lot of classic, you know, uh, scheduling um, uh, tasks in, in uh, uh, this industry, right? Including ticketing and uh, uh, destination planning, right? So uh, I'm just wondering, are you working with uh, companies like uh, Saber? We have somebody here on this call who represent this company. Are you doing it? Uh, how you do that? And maybe then this person can comment on your answer. So uh, it's as low tech as you could imagine. Um, this, the CEO of the company works with the itinerary people and they decide how they want to create itineraries by brand and they put those together. Um, I, it, it would be a logical thing to do, have some sort of uh, external input on what the right answer might be, as opposed to, well, we haven't been visited, uh, you know, a split in a while with this brand, it's probably a good idea. And, I, and of course, there's other factors, right? There's the, there, there's the, there is the, the cost of visiting the, the, um, the port. Uh, there's also side for the logistics issues of prices of fuel and all the other things and food that would have to be onboarded and that's all quite complicated. I would think actually our logistics department would be um, uh, would benefit dramatically from from uh, a, a, an AI type of as long as, long as it had enough inputs to help um, to help to help do these adjustments, but not really. Not yet. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. We have we have what a great. We have a great question from the audience. Allow me to uh, interrupt. So we, we, we have a question here uh, stating, and I, I, I mean, it's related with, with the topic at hand here. Can any one of the panelists name a sound business case where and how AI ML were implemented and high level business benefit derived from it? I bet sure. all of you. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. everyone could. Go ahead. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> who, who hasn't got a chance yet? Let's see. <laughs> yeah. I think Sergey didn't talk about that. About yeah, so does, I right? can, yes, uh, I can maybe defend AI a little bit. Uh, on one side, when I look at the statistics about the failure rate, uh, I went and uh, looked around a little bit and I saw uh, for example, new drug development has a success rate of 4%. So I think it's a little unfair to AI. We are definitely on this point on the curve where it's the most exciting and people expect, one, it will solve every single problem. And that's not true, right? So it, it's just another tool, very powerful tool, uh, but it doesn't mean that it will solve every single problem. And two, it's very easy to solve every problem with AI. You just collect your data, throw it into a box and the box come back with an answer within a week uh, of development and implementation work. And uh, it's, it's greater than everything else. Um, and as with any tool that requires expertise, it requires effort, it requires trial and errors. So uh, there is, needs to be a reasonable expectation on the success rate of, uh, of applying AI and ML. Uh, and uh, we do see uh, successful examples of uh, where it's helping. So um, we have a very specific uh, use case where we used uh, ML algorithms to predict propensity to buy ancillaries in travel industry, uh, which we couldn't do uh, with the regular methods. And uh, we saw uh, with uh, some of the partners, which we tried it with, we saw the uptick once our recommendations went live 
uh, compared to what it was uh, uh, with a manual practice. We saw the uptick in the conversion rate and we saw the, uh, uh, several million dollars a year benefit just from uh, one ancillary uh, that customers were buying. Uh, we also see application of ML in more scientific way to help scheduling problems and uh, resource optimization problems where we see traditional uh, problems like uh, screw optimization or network planning, which takes today using uh, standard operational research techniques takes hours to solve. We can see how ML embedded into these optimization algorithms can reduce run times by 80 to 90%. And that opens a lot of new opportunities for companies to react much faster uh, to the dynamics in the marketplace where you don't have to wait uh, for the system to come back with a recommendation for several hours. Uh, you can uh, get the answer very quickly and that allows to experiment with more use cases that allows to adjust much faster uh, to a changing market condition, which has been very useful in this COVID environment when airlines cannot real, uh, relate to uh, standard processes of developing schedule, very rigorous, uh, very uh, somewhat slow and disjoint pro uh, process where everything has to change almost daily. And uh, I believe this is where uh, ML techniques can, can speed up a process significantly. Yeah. Can I add a couple cents, uh, Marcus, to this question? Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Um, uh, so there is a famous Amara law, uh, and it basically says that people expectations with regard to new technologies, and uh, we're talking about AI now, right? Uh, are usually in the short term uh, over uh, um, hyped, okay? But in the long term is usually under uh, estimating those uh, expectations from new technologies. So uh, I think, um, um, can we turn a little bit towards where we are in travel industry with regard to post-COVID world? Uh, can like maybe George um, comment on, on what do you think George is most important or one of the most important things with regard to uh, post-COVID world and using AI in travel industry? Can you comment on that? <clears throat> you know, from, the way that we approach projects, we are not the scientists. We're invested in helping companies actually get a good outcome from the projects that they uh, that we recommend for them. And so I, I almost think, you know, and we've sort of talked about how much this is not so much a software problem as a wetware problem. Um, there are politics and there are people's uh, desires to protect their turf and so forth. And so there's a lot of very soft skills that go into this. I almost feel like if you have a project of any size, you should probably hire in a therapist as a team member to just trying to get everybody to chill out. I think, you know, when we talk about AI with people, one of the things that, that uh, having practitioners on this call, uh, I just want to put you all on the hook for it. One of the terrible things that I think <clears throat> we've all done is to, um, in order so that a lot of software vendors can slap a tag on their software that says new and improved now comes with AI. We've really done a disservice to our clients in totally mucking up the definition of AI. What is it? What are you buying? What do you think you're gonna get out of it? Ask a hundred clients, you'll get 200 different answers on what their expectations are. So it's almost like agile, you know, we saw a bunch of, uh, people in technologies go out and get agile training. And then they would come home and a month later, you'd say, so how's it going? They'd say, perfect, we're 100% agile. We break everything into two week sprints. So there's, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on our part to make sure that people understand what exactly this stuff is and how it's going to give them some sort of an outcome, not just an output. So actually, have, sorry, uh, George, just one, one, one pointer that you made, and that's very good. I saw some research that 40% of companies that in Europe that claim to use AI don't use AI. So, um, <laughs> uh, and then there's some other research out there that kind of people have done that said how many companies are actually, you know, um, walking the talk. Um, so yeah. very relevant point there. Well, I was going to call on Jakob, who, who, who basically believes that we could just stick with the machine learning branch of AI and do just fine. Jakob, you want to... Expand a little bit on that. 
Well, this is uh, what I was trying to comment earlier on, and even the question that we got from the audience might be looked at from this angle, right? Uh, why AI if if we can rely on a simple rule-based uh, system? So uh, not even machine learning, but, but something even more simpler. Uh, for the record, I'm not saying that all the problems of the world can be solved uh, by this. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, a simple regular expression and XPath uh, go a very long way when it comes to natural language processing. And uh, sometimes we are uh, taking too big of cannons to, to kill a small fly. At the same time, I think that uh, what you, George, mentioned is, is very important that uh, AI uh, on its own doesn't solve the problem that people want to solve. People want to solve some business problem. People want to automate certain things. And uh, automation, yes, this is, this is a need that we are seeing in travel industry right now because uh, we need to be more cost effective. We need to innovate, uh, yada, yada, yada. But whether this is um, a simple rule-based system or if it, if it is a super deep learning uh, algorithm, then it goes uh, down to what is more effective on the one hand and, and cheaper because uh, if uh, I need to spend $10 million uh, to save uh, $5,000, probably it doesn't add up. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and I wanted to connect it to something George and Anna were talking about earlier. You know, Anna, you mentioned these uh, sort of use cases where an enterprise realizes but the outputs of this project are so core to my business. They're so strategic that I need to own the stack, right? I need to build this myself. I need to DIY. Um, and then George, as you mentioned, you know, every vendor under the sun is sort of like now includes AI and they truly are those people who are sort of fusing some sort of use case or application with some ML, you know, uh, power or infrastructure. Those really are the black boxes because the, the increased productivity or whatever gain you're getting from machine learning tends to flow only to the application provider and uh, does not become an enterprise asset. And I think that is a really, uh, it, it, it's bad faith on, on behalf of vendors and saying, hey, AI included, and it, it mucks the marketplace up. But more importantly, most of the outputs that when well done come out of a machine learning system are super core to the enterprise. They will move the PL needle. It is, you know, it's core data, core insight, uh, uh, core output. And ultimately, I think the market is going to say that the enterprise needs to own those outputs, not have it be captive to some particular point solution application. Um, there, is a, there is a question that goes along very well with what you're saying, and I would like to um, pass it on. So uh, Max is asking, what kind of AI ML tech would you recommend in terms of simplicity of implementation and integration and then hiring the talent or you know, building the team. Um, you know, I think it goes point on with what Richard was saying. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy to answer. Someone else can go. Anna, go for it. Um, I, I'll just talk about our company specifically, not even try to talk about someone else's company who they should hire. I mean, what we've learned is having a very small number of very, very brilliant people is like orders of magnitude better than having a large team of people who don't quite understand or can't quite work with the model and also um, can't do what Jakob was talking about, which is say, hey, this is not a spot for AI. <laughs> you know, we should just like, here's an old school approach and guess what? It gets, you know, 95% of the value and and it's, it'll all be done in five or six minutes. <laughs> um, you know, so really understanding not just how to use the tools, but where they're powerful and where they're weak. Um, I mean, in our platform, we have almost, I think at this point, 64 microservices and maybe only nine of them use any sort of AI. And I think that also goes into what makes something successful. Um, the sort of original question, right? If you go in and say, we're gonna solve this entire problem with AI, you're probably gonna fail because it isn't just an AI problem. It's probably a much more diverse problem that can be solved in, with humans <laughs> in the loop, right? With automation in the loop, with classical, a li maybe a little classical AI, but probably maybe a little bit of associative AI for these sort of big data problems. And they all have to fit together. And, and someone's brain needs to be big enough to understand how to do that uh, intelligently. Um, this, 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 what you're saying reminds me of a quote from Gardner, from Andy White there, AI ML guru over there. And he was predicting 
that uh, in 2020 and maybe 21 that you know most of the AI projects uh, would remain like alchemy. He used the word alchemy uh, to talk about it. He said it's it's run by a few gurus, few wizards, um, and he kind of talked about the disservice because their talents don't scale across the organization. So how does that play at the at the at the enterprise level? Is that uh, you know, are they going to be relying on a few people that are these wizards doing alchemy in the back room, or what's 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 going to happen in travel on that front? I think this is a corporate risk because you can't, as a large corporation, put your ha- your life in the hands of one individual. Um, and I think it becomes very difficult because there is a certain degree of alchemy in there. Um, but it's also one of the hardest things to sell into a senior level management. If they simply can't understand what's going on, their propensity to buy is very, very low. So I think this is where, coming back to one of the original questions, I think you need to build confidence and go step by step and not go for moonshots to begin with. And anyway, if you go for a moonshot, you're never going to get the business case approved or whatever, even if people see it, see a big thing at the end of it. But I think people need to learn, build a variety of strategies and linking back to the last question, what's the right tool set? It all depends what you're trying to do. And I think it comes back to the very basic business questions of what do you need to do to succeed as a business? Are some of those more suited to artificial ways of doing things? And are some of them suited to other things? And, and just don't use the same tool to crack every problem. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you have to probably, uh, um, who's going first? <laughs> I think, you know, just in the hotel world, right, when you look at all the companies that are out there, all the hotel companies, and uh, you, you could probably argue, you know, in the, in the area of, of, of pricing and revenue management that we operate in, um, you know, when you look a few years back and how many had their own proprietary tech, and, and, and you could argue there's maybe a very, very small number, I'm not going to say how many, but a very small number who really do it well, that, that have their own tech. Um, and more and more realize that either they need to have a combination of kind of a best of breed plus their own teams, or they're just using um, kind of an outside vendor and then augment that with a couple, like Anna said, very smart people that can that can keep the vendor in check and keep challenging the vendor to make sure that they're doing the, the best that they can do. Um, so that the, the, the notion of you know having the proprietary tech and building everything internally is kind of shifted over the last few years. And I think that it's even accelerating now. That's what we're seeing. Well, I think that this all makes sense when we are talking about breakthrough innovation, self-driving cars, uh, self-flying planes, etc. But uh, in reality, I, I think that 80% of problems that we are solving don't require breakthrough AI. And uh, when it comes to that type of uh, challenges, uh, from my perspective, we are observing some sort of commoditization of uh, machine learning uh, with all those courses on Coursera, even on other uh, platforms. It's super easy for a student, uh, a, a person who is interested, take a, a, a course and, and do a tutorial and uh, solve a part of a problem. And, and again, maybe it's not like 95% precision, but maybe 70% uh, is, is just enough, or maybe 70% is enough for a proof of concept, and then you can hire uh, some really smart person. So it's probably just like the same thing we, we had with internet. I remember at the beginning of uh, 2000, maybe 1990s, right, when only wizards could send an email over internet. And now this is something that my kids are, are doing. I, I, I agree. totally agree with that. I think, um, the, oh no, I was just going to say, you know, the, the, the market as it has everywhere is going to move from sort of builders to, to users. And so the sort of wizard problem inside the enterprise is going to go away very fast and you're going to consume AI like you consume AWS, right? And so it's all going to be about the quality of the outputs, which again is going to be, Jacob, I agree, largely commoditized, meaning what AWS is putting out, like you used to have to rack your own servers, right? No one would think of doing that now, or very, very, very few. And it's just not a uh, it's just not a risky thing to use AWS or Azure or any other cloud provider. Um, right now, people are also you know the big strategics are are in housing a lot of this stuff, but it's going to get spit out of from multiple places as a commodity, and it's really going to be quality of outputs and how are you integrating the outputs into the right workflows 
to realize actual value uh, from the outputs of ML. I yeah, I completely agree. So I think I this think is a, an are, interim yeah. problem. Yeah, I, I think what we're going to see is people are going to buy capabilities, not systems, right? That's what you're talking about, Richard. It's, it's yep. we're, right. we're breaking apart these, these software platforms and systems into its capabilities. And then people just buy the capability that they need when they need it. And they do that today with AWS or, or Azure. And tomorrow they're going to do it with AI and, and, and analytics. Let me, let From me. From my perspective, back the problem uh, is specific finding uh, Sorry, domain Jakob. experts who understand. Okay. Sorry, Jakob. I just want to pull it back for one minute and play devil's advocate. I, like, I, I agree with the, 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 the dimension and direction we're going from. Uh, from a technology perspective, but what about travel data has uh, the sort of aspect of being, and I'm sure it's in other industries, I just happen to know travel, but very siloed. Uh, you know, there's this notion of gatekeepers. There's this notion of large enterprises that sit on loads of data. George brought up the fact that um, there's kingdom and fiefdoms around data. Um, is, is, is this sort of final sort of proof that uh, travel starts to open up some of this data. You've seen maybe companies like Three Victors that have recently come out and uh, just data as a service or Hopper who sits on probably more data than most out there. Talk to, talk to the audience a little bit about um, the unique challenges of data as it relates to this future that we're gonna see in AI and ML. So we uh, initially thought we'd go in and provide our platform, which does a whole bunch of fancy things. And um, in talking to every customer, they were like, well, this sounds interesting, but <laughs> we're not sure how to store access or learn from our data. <laughs> and we were like, oh, maybe there's a, a pre-service a pre here called how should you store um, you know, structure and learn from your data. And we don't, like, that's not our business. We can just tell you we, what we think the right approach is. Um, and how you take all your historical data, right? How you merge it and also what real time information you should gather, whether it makes sense to merge historical data or you have 92 million non COVID, you know, customers. So don't worry about the past, right? Just um, let real time information flow in and, and work from there. Um, and that was, I think, quite a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a surprise for us that um, we could offer as much value. Like that's not an AI thing. That's just like a, how to, how to set stuff up. Um, but that we could add value there. It was kind of cool. How many customers did you walk into that actually had a data governance model or some understanding of how to deal with all of the data that they were sitting on? Where they were like ready to go and we were just like, um, I can only think of one where we only had an integration issue with one of their systems. And it was just how, like a, just a, a call. It was a reservation system. And when you called it, it did sort of funny things. But yeah, every single one of them, um, which has been really interesting. But isn't that another excuse me, religious fight there among the technologists. You've got the people who say, start with a data lake and layer on SQL, stick it in Snowflake, and within 10 years, everything you need to do will come through that path. And then you've got the other ones on the other side saying, oh, no, no, it's got to be a data lake and wrap it with Python and this and that, and we'll give you SQL overlays, and so you can put everything in a data lake. Now there's lake houses that are kind of splitting the difference. Soon there'll be apartments in the city and flats and all that. You know, I'm, it's another thing that people can't eat, the, the technology groups can't even agree on what sort of a structure should we put our data in. So I totally agree with you. I think there will be a, a lot of money to be made in just helping companies understand for the kind of data you have and what you want to do with it. Here's how you should structure it. And here's a couple of uh, easy things that you should, can layer on top of it just so that you can get started. It's, it's part of the therapy. Our, yeah. our view is also though that everything is gonna move to streaming. And so this problem is gonna, is gonna go away a little bit too in that the most important, like, you know, the analog of the browser say in, in travel commerce, uh, you know, it kicks off enough just real time event data to do many of the highest value use cases you can, you can get out of ML. And I think in other verticals and other use cases, there is, you know, slowly or, or quickly, um, there's a software operating system that underlies almost every business process at this point in almost every vertical. And they're just going to increasingly be kicking off uh, real-time event data, uh, no matter how tactile the industry is. And that's going to be, those are going to be the sources and a lot of the sort of mining and organization 
um, problems that that we all experience are going to go away. I think that's become even more so during the pandemic because what use the data lake of what you've collected for the last five years now? In in most cases, it's just simply not useful. And I think yeah. the closer you get to real time, the more valuable the data. I think uh, uh, that, that there is, of course, a need of building right data uh, resources and platforms, lakes, cities, as long as they're not swamps, right? Uh, but I think more importantly uh, for AI to become truly actionable is the um, um, ability of us experts to talk to non-experts in plain English and talk about business value and value proposition like in standard business, maybe one-on-one -on -one terms, because I think this is uh, a lot lost in translation. That's why uh, when we talk to some of our clients and uh, uh, we can't even start with AI, we, we have to start with basics. Where are your data, right? Like Anna was commenting. And of course, garbage in, garbage out, right? So we'd like to, to address those issues. And uh, I'd like to kind of, ask this question, uh, our experts, uh, I 100% agree that there would be a transition from wizard AI to uh, useful and actionable AI of masses, but how long that will take? Because I'd like to hear expertise uh, um, kind of predictions on that. Nobody's willing Nobody, to Nobody's, uh, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Maybe you should take I can say that Black Crow, that's what can... we're doing. That's what we're doing right now is we're sort of skipping the builders. So we're sort of machine learning infrastructure as a service. And our whole thesis is that the builder as a persona of, of you know, buyers in AI ML is, is going to die. And it's not going to die in the Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 anytime soon but we're sort of targeting the middle 66% of the market who maybe didn't have the best data engineers or any data engineers and doesn't have the wizard a data scientist. And those are the those builders would have responded to some business need in the, you know, the revenue management or the pricing, you know, pricing or marketing or whatever um, group inside the org. And we're just going right to those users and, and you can deliver, you know, the handful of things that will, I, I'm always uh, obsessed with things that move the P&L, but you can deliver those ML outputs for about the cost of one data scientist. And so I think, well, you know, assuming we, we uh, uh, continue to exist and thrive, it's, it's already starting to happen. So Richard, are you saying the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed? Is that what you're saying? I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a great so, way of putting it. so Richard already made a prediction. It's already here in, in some places. Any other predictions or comments? I, I, I would say it's been here for a while. It's just how you use it. Mm -hmm. um, and a good example would be if, if you use AI to drive recommendations, for example. And we've come across some large companies who have tested it out and said, well, okay, we can see it's great. We can see it saves money but we've got a specialist team who do this too. So you test them out together and they have exactly the same level of results as the specialist team, but they want to keep their specialist team without thinking actually the power of AI is really improving every month. So if you come back in a year, this specialist team will be doing the same thing, whereas AI will have moved on leaps and bounds. And I think there is an intellectual challenge that people have to really think if things are moving this fast, what will it be like in a year? Where should I invest? People are getting more expensive. Technology is getting cheaper. Which one do I invest in? You know, I would argue, Eugene, to your, to your point, right? That's two people really, the end user, do they care how, they, how you get the results? What they care is what are the results and give me the best possible results, right? What, what the methodology is, you know, AI and ML and all that, I think, to some extent is probably used by companies to increase their value, valuation. But um, coming back to the 40% of companies in Europe that say they use AI, but they don't. Um, so it's, it's really when we have conversations with our clients about new methodologies, we don't talk about what we're using to achieve the goal. We talk about what the ROI is and what the outputs are and how is it going to make the business better. 
well, do, do people really in the end care how you do it as a, as a, as a practitioner or an expert? I would argue not so much. At the same time, I think that we shouldn't be hyper optimistic about uh, AI ML adoption, because uh, on the one hand, it is becoming more accessible, like, like we all said, right? Commoditization, commoditization etc. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's just like with internet, just like with programming, it's, uh, it has never been easier to start programming than, than today, but still uh, you need some skills to write reasonable programs. You need to understand the domain, uh, you need to understand the customer problem, uh, you need to focus on it, and uh, even maybe when it comes to AI, the most important challenge is uh, what you, Gene, said, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? So preparing the data, uh, removing the noise uh, from the data, understanding uh, that you need to pre-process it before you feed uh, your deep uh, neural networks, etc. This is crucial. And I think that with all those Coursera is the available courses, the understanding of statistics remains. And this is where we may hit into a wall that people just want to feed they are Amazon bricks uh, with, with nice data, but then there is no reasonable results because, well, garbage in, garbage out. Sergey, it looked like you were going to say something. Did, did, uh... Uh, well, I, I think we are, we should separate building uh, AI ML enabled systems and using AI ML uh, enabled systems. Uh, and I'm with Anna here. And I also look at the history on how we use our area of mathematics or statistics. It's difficult to bring it to the masses uh, and for everyone to build their own uh, AI ML systems. Uh, the practice shows me that uh, we need to have a few brilliant people who understand how to look at the data and, and judge the quality, how to look at the models and how to judge the quality. But then uh, these systems need to be transparent and need to show uh, what I was talking about, what's the value, what's ROI, how to trust them, how to validate them, uh, and how to talk about them in an easy, plain English, Russian, any, any other language. And then in terms of using uh, these models, um, then I think we will, uh, and, and they are already there, and, and I think we'll propagate uh, market and business uh, much faster than maybe we even expect. <clears throat> Anybody who is using Netflix by now is probably trusting the recommendation that Netflix gives. Anybody who is looking at YouTube by now is probably trusting or, or at least learn that, yeah, it provides a reasonable thing. So I think this is how AI and ML will if go. If you want to be radicalized. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it comes back to the theme which uh, came up several times already. And, and this is what we see uh, as a key as well. There needs to be a business value. There needs to be an ROI or, or an understanding from the uh, board level to the individual user that uh, what, uh, what kind of benefit this new technology brings to me. And there needs to be a trust in this technology, not necessarily understanding on how it works, but the trust that the results will make things better, more efficient, higher revenue, uh, smaller cost, and so on. And then the role of technology is to make it faster, make it cheaper, make it uh, more and more efficient for building and adopting this, uh, these models. George, you have a you human factors a number of times. Are we going to get around the human factors to get to that state? Or are we already at that state? What's your, what's your perspective? I think we just got to get rid of all the humans. I mean, <laughs> the answer is obvious. <laughs> what did you call it? Wetware? Is that what you call wet it? Wetware. Yeah. <laughs> wetware. Um, yeah, I think the, the human factors loom large. But, you know, I, I've been listening to everybody and thinking about the adoption curve. And for, I mean, it's like the adoption curve for almost anything. I'm a product guy. Products have adoption curves. AI is a product that is not very well formed right now. The messaging isn't right. Um, there's too much confusion over what it is. But like any other product that has a lot of value, it will eventually you know, come around. And I think in your original question, you said, is this all just part of the adoption process? And there's a cynical take on it that says, yes, sadly, this is the you know, the human swamp that we live in and things like this that are um, very powerful, but also require a little bit of understanding. They have this adoption curve that takes a little while. 
Um, I, I am very enthusiastic about it though. I think the, the interesting thing is, you know, we ask questions like, how long will it be before AI really comes to us? And not only is it here, it's been here for a long time. Everybody who's got a smartphone with a, a Cortana or, well, not Cortana, a smartphone. What? If there's anybody out there with a Windows phone, okay, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, Siri and, and uh, all the little intelligent agents who have blended in so nicely that it's like electricity. You don't think about it, it's here, it's working. What we've got to do is have it apply in a, in a broader sense to business problems in a way that the wetware can tolerate. And so I know that there are good reasons for going after big projects because you can have a huge impact, you can really move the needle and whatnot. But I think, you know, this going back to, I think it was Andy said early on, it's like crossing the chasm. We have to get to the point where we have enough small success stories everywhere that are referenceable, where you can say, you know, I know that you've never had this type of capability built into your central res system for your hotel, but look at what it's doing over here for these guys and these guys and these guys. And if we build up on enough of these small to medium sized projects where we can point, like the first question that came up, where have you seen it work? There and there and there and there. And when we have those, those are the referenceable case studies that will push us over the chasm, get us to that next group of adopters, and then allow this thing to really fade into the background completely. And we will have, occasionally, we will need the, the high level geniuses who are getting 800,000 or a million dollars. Boy, am I in the wrong job mm -hmm. area. Data science is where it's at. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have a need for some of those guys for the bleeding edge stuff, but the rest of it will just be baked in and, you know, we'll, we'll be reaping the benefits much more uniformly, let's say. Um, I, I have a I have a question. I have a question from the audience here, uh, which I think goes with what uh, George was saying. Um, can one effectively apply AI ML and derive business benefit when you don't yet know or understand big data structures and shape and trends? Just knowing overall high level number domains. It, it depends on the task, right? If you have um, very, very approximate understanding of what you want to do, if you have very, very approximate understanding what you would like to get out of it, um, no AI or ML gonna help you. You better kind of get crisper um, to your problem uh, definition, right? And the optimization function and what you would like to get out of it for business, right? That would help you. Uh, whether ML, AI, uh, linear regression, or um, standard apply stat, okay? So I, I think the better you are on, you know, getting very uh, clear um, parameters you'd like to optimize, the better you're gonna be um, getting results. That's a great point. I agree with that. Both, both the understanding of a problem and understanding of a data is crucial to, to make it successful. Yeah, I have, a, I have a couple of good examples. So there's always been this question in revenue management and pricing, <clears throat> you know, does weather, does weather impact your pricing, right? Big conversation for many, many years. And so, so we did some research and it's like, well, what does it do? Well, we, we kind of decided that it doesn't really impact your pricing. There's other signals that you can pick up. You don't need to look at weather forecasts, right? And then we looked at reputation. Does reputation impact pricing? And we did a we did a 18 month research study around that, and we actually found out yes, it does. And so we incorporated it into our pricing methodologies, and we got a patent on it and all that. Um, so you have to ask what the question is, and you have to ask: Is it going to make an impact? Is that additional data that you're importing or looking at actually going to drive a better outcome or not? And every time we look at a new data set. We, we, we say to ourselves, is that gonna make a better outcome or is it just not gonna change any, any, any needle that we're looking at? And if it's not, then why do it, right? You know, I, I would phrase that last question a little bit differently, but I have a question for, I guess, the rest of the guys in the call. And that is, who do you think in the organization as we move through this adoption curve is, where should we be looking in the organizations 
for people to come up with the idea of, oh, that's something that we might apply AI to. Where, who, who are the people who call you in? And is that a technical function or a business function? Or is it one, but it should be the other? I'd say it's, does... very, it's very rarely the technical function at the moment. Um, very rarely. I'd say it's often the senior marketing team or customer experience team, um, if not the CEO. Mm -hmm. And innovators, George, I think innovators, those out of box thinkers, right? Irrespective of where they are within the org, they usually call us in. Uh, so it depends on the organization, of course, right? Yeah. But I From think my when, perspective, when this, it's is, this is the product team that looks at the problem. Please, please go on, Richard. No, no, go ahead, Jacob. I think we're out of time. Well, <laughs> very, just very quickly, from my perspective, this is the product team because they are looking at the problem and they are to find the best solution for the problem. Of course, they not always uh, have the best skills to implement, but then they should be able to understand, okay, this is, uh, this is something that requires using React.js or maybe machine learning or maybe uh, MySQL, right? But, uh, and, and then if we don't have uh, MySQL skills or React.js, then uh, we may need a consultant. We may need uh, to start working with, with someone within or out, from outside of the organization. But we understand the problem. We understand uh, that this is something that can be addressed with this or that technology. I think coming back to the very first question, if the, if the demand is coming from the technology group, one of two things is happening. One, it's because they're responding to a demand in the commercial or operational organization in some way. And that's a good thing. Um, or it is a really tech driven project. And that's where I think a lot of fails come from. Not necessarily technical fails, but value delivery fails. Meaning they wanna be at the cutting edge using the best tools, able to do things, but with no clear mandate to actually do anything in particular. I see both push and pulls in, in to answer that question. Um, I do believe commercial and, and business units, when they face a problem, uh, they can pose this problem and, and ask technology or ask providers, can this problem be solved with AI and ML? Uh, but in many cases, they uh, might not even know uh, that uh, it's, it's possible to solve it. So I, I can see where we go and because we understand or have some experience on uh, how the problems can be solved using AML, we offer these solutions. And then it becomes a collaboration where uh, we say, this is what's possible. Do you think it, it will be useful? And, and then they, if they recognize the value, then uh, you know, we, we start collaborating. What about you, Andy? And you see it any differently? Um, no. I. I, I our experience is it's largely uh, people who are close to the customer who've got a customer problem to solve in our domain that bring us in and, and we work with. Um, very, very rarely do we dive into technical challenges where we pull those people from the technology team. And if we do, then you've got a whole other area of convincing to, to pursue. For us, it's where is the budget and the budget's increasingly sitting in marketing. That's what we're seeing too in marketing. Oh, this is the one that owns the problem, simply. <laughs> um, Marcus, I know we're at question time and we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, are, is there another question to queue up or I have a question? Um, we do have another question, which was really great. One second. Um, no, no, no. We have already asked all the questions. Okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask a question, George, um, you know, at the end of years, you were talking about, um, <clears throat> becoming familiar and this, and sort of, uh, step-by-step -step process. C can I hear from everybody? What are, and again, I, I, I think we have to be careful about terminology just for the audience's sake. Like we were using Sergey, you're using ancillaries and I'm not sure everybody on the, on the call will, uh, understand that that's a product relevant to airlines. So let's be careful of our terminology, but can, can you guys share with the audience um, what are the live use cases of AI or ML right now that, uh, that you see that are relevant, that people on the call are listening in might 
recognize or see? How is it, how is it manifesting in these small steps? Sure, and maybe I'll start and, and clarify uh, one which I used first. Uh, so ancillaries is anything that airlines or maybe hotels sell in addition to a core product, just the right to fly from point A to point B or the right to stay somewhere. So in our particular case, we've seen and we've implemented an ML uh, model which uh, identifies the optimal price for the premium seat. And an airline says, uh, I have an extra leg room or there is an exit uh, uh, row uh, seat. What should be the optimal price for that seat? And based on the historical data and based on the continuous learning of how customers respond to these different prices, we are able to uh, recommend optimal prices and we are able to compare it with what uh, manual practice uh, existed before and we can see the improvement. Um, and then I, I'll give a second example more relevant for, for global demand management. We uh, implemented a methodology using again multiple ML algorithms which predicts demand between two cities in the world. Uh, how many people will travel between Chicago and London in July of uh, next year? Um, so we uh, it, it's this is, this is a very good use case because it takes a lot of different data uh, to understand the volume of a demand. And uh, a lot of different signals can be teased out from many different uh, type of information. And we see where ML methods, complicated uh, ML methods, help increase uh, or improve the accuracy of these predictions compared to basic linear regressions, which, uh, we, which we used before. And that obviously accurate knowledge of the demand helps airlines plan their networks, help hotels to, uh, to create their offers. And so everyone would want to know how many people are coming to my city uh, from a particular destination. Yeah, our, our favorite or my, I guess my personal, I shouldn't say our companies because each person in our company has a different favorite, but um, my personal favorite use case is um, not just trying to go for personalization and understand and trying to say that your customer is a fixed thing in space and time, right? Um, like the same person who's going to eat a hot dog is going to go to a Michelin restaurant, most likely. So understanding from booking history, from processing chat, from explicit asking, particularly right now during COVID, um, from, you know, location service data, contextual factors, who is somebody in place and time? You know, who are they in the morning? Who are they in the afternoon? Who are they in the evening? Not trying to like demographically group people into static segments and not trying to build a single static profile for someone, but trying to have a spatially, temporally aware model of who your customer is, um, you know, that, that works in real time and is online um, so that you, you can respond to them. Um, I, I think that that's our, our core use case for AI, where we really can't do that or solve that problem in a traditional way and in part it's because in travel data tends to be a little bit sparse and so in some cases we have to have a customer ask their customer explicitly hi human <laughs> who are you and what do you want right now <laughs> um you know and in some cases we have to take data from a different context not a competitive right not a partner's competitor but you know we work across hotel cruise airline um, theme park, business travel, leisure travel, mobility. So we have data from really, really different contexts and we can use the learning from all of those different contexts to have enough insight with not too much information on a person to say either what question do we need to ask to know who they are right now and what do they want and what they need or um, who are they right now and so what should you show them or how should you interact with them to improve their experience. And are you seeing uh, in post-COVID uh, users' behavior changing and how they interact and accept uh, interface and those types of questions as they're going? What are you seeing from the market? So we don't yet, I wish we had a stronger signal on this. This is my like my goal for by the end of December is to validate that right now you can ask people more questions, right? Like where are you really looking forward to going? <laughs> you know, what, what food do you really wish you've eaten? Like who do you wanna see? All of those sort of questions that usually feel like a survey, um, I think right now feel a little aspirational. And so there is a lot of opportunity um, to get some really good real time data that then can be used for all kinds of things like demand forecasting and you know when should I fly an airline you know a plane between A and B or 
when should I add staff to bring my hotel, you know, back from 50 to 60% occupancy? I can tell you, we're very focused on predicting um, future value of users. So in, in sort of, you know, the B2C digital applications of travel companies, um, you know, we're also focused on real time. And so, you know, 20 milliseconds after any user action inside of a, a commerce environment, we will spit back the future value of that user in a sort of real time uh, fire hose so that the, the brand that we're working with knows, oh, this user is going, here's their likelihood to convert, here's their expected value. And then that flows into a whole variety of things that the brand may wanna do differently, right? They may wanna bid differently in Google, they may want to uh, increase or decrease the prominence of their 800 number. You know, there's all sorts of things that when you know this particular user's value is 50X this other user's value, things that you want to do differently uh, in your interaction with that user. That sounds well uh, beyond the boundaries of travel, right? That sounds like it could apply to any, any industry. Is there, is there something? Yeah, yeah. We don't focus just on travel, but, but you're absolutely right. Is there something that travel can learn from watching how retail is doing, or is this application going to work as well in travel as it does in other places? <clears throat> I think it will work as well. You know, I think Anna's totally right that there's spar a sparse data problem in travel because, you know, for three weeks out of the year, it's the most important thing in a consumer's life. And then they just ghost your brand for the next 12 months. You know, they do not care. But when you get into other categories, there's more frequent, uh, purchases and interactions. So you can sort of, there's more signal um, there to create prediction. So we actually started in travel and moved out. We had no idea how hard what we started with actually was. That's right. Thank you. Any other use cases? Yeah, I, I'd say ours is not dissimilar. And it, it's taking that, what's the value of a customer? What's their propensity to do something? And then working out how to help old travel systems reshape in real time to respect that. Whether that is changing the sort order to be preferential for the things that you think people are after or changing the recommendations or saying this person actually would benefit from these kind of reviews rather than those kind of reviews or they need a call center to call them or they need uh, uh, an interaction with a chat bot or they need fundamentally the website to start changing around them so that it suits the needs for what they're after right now, rather than designing sites so that they're the same for every single user. And essentially the, the kind of prevailing non-AI approach or, or, or prevailing digital approach is to build the best possible site for the average user. Whereas I think what we want to get to, or certainly our vision is, how can we design a site or a mobile channel or whatever it is that wraps itself around the user because we've accurately predicted what they're after in real time. And you simply can't do that with rules. Yeah. And at our help, we are using, well, generic answer to this question is that we are using uh, machine learning to solve decision problems that are too complex to be easily described uh, with simple heuristics. Because if you can use heuristics, then it's cheaper, faster, and probably more effective. But uh, so an example of, of heuristics uh, is uh, whether a claim is eligible and should we send it to airline? Because there are some clear, clear rules, right? But uh, whether a claim is strong enough to go to court, then this becomes a little bit more tricky. It depends on jurisdiction. This, become, this depends on weather, and yada, yada, yada. So this is where it may make sense to apply machine learning. Another example is whether an email contains itinerary or not, right? Because it could be just uh, me writing to you, Greg, hey, I'm going to, to come to, to Dallas to, to visit Sergey uh, and uh, have a steak. Uh, and then Dallas appears, maybe a date appears, but still this is not an itinerary. Uh, so describing itinerary with heuristics may be difficult. And this is uh, where, for example, we found it uh, useful. Or an ex and a problem that we are working together with Anna, uh, can we predict uh, whether a particular flight uh, will be delayed uh, by more than a couple of hours? And uh, this is again, yes, uh, it has time of year has influence because uh, of, of uh, snowstorms, mist, etc. Yes, certain airports, but if you cannot really describe it with heuristics, so this is where machine learning may come in handy. Fantastic. Looking to go. Looking forward to going to Dallas to have a steak with Sergey at some point. Please do. We all do. 
<laughs> so when we're gonna do it? That's the key question for our AI task number n plus one, right? Well, can, and can we not do it in Dallas? <laughs> <laughs> That's another interesting AI question. <laughs> We should do it in the repopulation area. <laughs> Richard has PTSD from Dallas. <laughs> it's really true. There's, there's a song that they play on the rental car shuttle going between the terminal and the rental car center. And it was the same song on repeat, which I listened to, you know, every week for four years. And I've heard it in other contexts and, uh, and uh, it is traumatizing. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to sing this song? <laughs> don't don't get me started. Unless you want to see a Zoom meltdown. No offense to the people of Dallas. This is really about the world. rental car center. <laughs> okay. On that note, I think we'll. It's been uh, such a pleasure today. I I would say uh, to summarize would do it injustice. It's been really thrilling. I've learned a lot. I'm I'm sure each of you have learned something. Um, this has been exciting. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you, George. Um, thank you, Jakob. Thank you, Marco, Sergey, Andy, Anna, Jean. I really appreciate you, Richard, coming in and uh, grateful for the time. Thank you, audience, for chiming in with the great questions. Um, looking forward, hopefully, to a, another session in the future. And until then, I wish you all well. I'll hopefully see you in not Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> happy holidays. Happy yep. holidays. Bye, happy holidays. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye everyone. Dear audience, thank you so very much for your participation. Remember to share your feedback through any of the available channels. And see you around.